Welcome to our worship from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar. The hymn which ends the service is sung by the choristers of St Martin in the Fields. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the first letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith, and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called, and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time, he who is the blessed and only Sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality, and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty, or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may, may take hold of the life that really is life. The reading is taken from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to the end. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. 
let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Here ends the lesson. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. One of the most poignant and powerful moments in the Queen's funeral, for me, came right at the end of the committal service in Windsor, as the crown, orb and sceptre were silently removed from her coffin and placed on the altar. They'd been hers to wear during her reign, but now they were to be passed on to a new sovereign. She had no need of them. They were no use to her any more. We know that the Queen had been closely involved in planning her funeral, so the fact that this was done so publicly was obviously deliberate and her choice. The funeral in Westminster Abbey had begun with another similar reminder. As her coffin was brought in, the choir sang, We brought nothing into the world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out. Their words from the first letter to Timothy, which quite by coincidence was one of today's set readings. The Queen was obviously keen that the message that you can't take it with you should come across and that it applied to her just as much as to anyone else. It's often a struggle though for us to get our heads around that. Those words, part of the standard opening to a funeral, can sound unbearably stark. I only tend to use them if the family have requested them. They aren't something you want to spring on people unexpectedly. But they're true, and sooner or later we all discover that. The story Jesus tells in our Gospel reading unpacks that sentiment. Before we look at it, can I just stress that it is a story, a parable, very much in the form of a folk tale. It's not meant to be a systematic theological guide to life after death. The Bible is actually rather vague about what exactly happens after death, which is not surprising. It was written over many hundreds of years by many different people. Ideas developed and everyone had their own perspective. But the most important reason for their vagueness is that getting life after death pinned down just wasn't really a priority for the biblical writers. They were far more concerned with life before death. And that's what Jesus is talking about here, life before death, and in particular, money and what it means to us. He tells this parable, we're told, to those among the Pharisees who loved money. He uses vivid, often over-the-top images, The poor man, Lazarus, lying at the gates, his sores licked by dogs. The rich man in his purple and fine linen. Purple was a fantastically expensive dye, made from the tiny murex seashell, which was reserved for the very highest levels of society. And fine linen was a luxury option too. This is a man who really loves his bling. If he'd had taps in his house, you can be sure they'd have been made of solid gold. He thinks his money makes him the bee's knees. He wants everyone else to know about it. His nose is so far in the air that he doesn't even notice Lazarus at his gates, despite the fact that he presumably has to walk past him every time he goes in and out of his house. But when both men die, the positions are dramatically reversed. Lazarus is seated with Abraham, the great patriarch of the Jewish people. He's honoured and comforted, while far below, the rich man suffers unspecified torments. The rich man calls out for Lazarus to be sent to help him. Even then, he treats Lazarus as if he's just there to serve him. When he's told that that's impossible... He asks for Lazarus to be sent to his living brothers, to warn them to live justly so that they can avoid his fate. But Abraham dryly points out that living justly isn't rocket science. 
Moses and the prophets had been very clear about it. The Jewish scriptures, our Old Testament, are full of warnings about the importance of caring for the poor and vulnerable, of creating a society where all are equally valued and provided for. If they haven't seen that, then they haven't been paying attention. And even if someone came back from the dead, they're not likely to change. This is meant, of course, to be a subtle reference to the resurrection of Jesus. Human beings are remarkably good at not seeing what's right in front of us. After all, it's abundantly clear and well proven that human activity is causing climate catastrophe. It's happening before our eyes, but we don't often act as if we believe it. Abraham knows that it's not outward proof that's needed, but inner transformation and attitudes to money and possessions are at the heart of that transformation. Possessions and the money we use to buy them are important to us. The Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with them in themselves. God made a material world and called it good, and we certainly can't live without possessions. The problem is, though, that money almost always comes to mean far more to us than its simple financial value. Money can be a sign of status. If you have more, you're worth more as a person. And the giveaway evidence of that is the way we use words like worth, value and treasure interchangeably, not only about cash, but also about personal importance. Some people are valued colleagues whom we treasure, others aren't worth bothering with. We may have low self-worth, or no, we don't value ourselves enough to treasure ourselves. Money can also become a symbol of security to us. If we have savings, we feel safe. And it may be true that they'll protect us to a certain extent. But no amount of money can guarantee, guarantee us a happy life, or stop us getting old or ill. And in the end, we will all lose it in death. The security money offers is ultimately an illusion. Not only does putting our faith in money ultimately fail us, says the letter to Timothy, along the way it often skews our vision, sours our souls and poisons our community life. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money itself, but the status and security we project onto it the love we have for it. The writer of the letter to Timothy sees this happening in the lives of people around him, people whose eagerness to be rich ends up piercing them with many pains, diverting their attention from the things that would really bring them and those around them the life that really is life, life that's marked by righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Our readings today don't pull their punches, and if we find them hard to hear, that's probably as it should be, especially in a week which has seen a new budget, which has left even seasoned commentators scratching their heads. I'm not a politician or an economist, and I usually steer well clear of offering an opinion on these matters. But whatever its long-term aim, in the short term this budget does seem to make the rich richer and the poorest even worse off than they were to start with. Maybe in the long term it will do some good, but that's how it looks right now, to the people who need help right now. In the midst of a cost of living crisis, I can't be the only one who's worried about what the effect of it will be in these coming months on the most vulnerable in our society the ones who often pay no in income tax and don't benefit from any cuts, even of 1%. What I am sure of, though, is that the warnings of our readings today are as important to us now as they were when they were first written. They invite us, whether we're rich or poor, to consider what money means to us, how having it or not having it makes us feel what conclusions it leads us to draw about ourselves or about other people. These stories invite us to wonder 
where our attitudes to money come from and to bring those attitudes into the light of God, the source of the life that really is life in this world and in the next. Amen. And so as we bring our prayers to God, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.